I'm Jane Stafford. I started weaving in 1978 and bought my first Louette loom in 1986. Over the ensuing years, I have been a production weaver, a teacher, and a retailer. My favorite looms to this day are Louette looms. I am very pleased to be your guide throughout this presentation. Hi, here we are with the first of our looms. It is the spring loom. The spring loom is a parallel counter marsh loom. It comes with a built-in rattle system. It has a floating breast beam right here. And it is available in two widths. It's available in a 90 centimeter, which is 35 inches in our neck of the woods, and 110 centimeters is 43 inches in our neck of the woods. Um, you can get a second warp beam that goes in the back here, and you can also get a sectional warp beam for this loom. We're going to dress this loom and show you how to put a warp on over the top of the loom, spreading it out in the rattle. We're going to attach this to the apron rod. To do that, we need to release the tension on the apron rod. This is the brake system right here, and we're going to lift up on the brake, and I'll pull, and the apron rod comes up over the top of the back beam. You can adjust the tension on this friction brake by releasing this little nut. Right now we have lots of tension on this friction brake. But if I lift up on that and take some thread out of the little nut, then all of a sudden this moves a whole lot easier on its own. So there we are, we're ready to attach the warp. One of the great things about this rattle is that it allows us to dress a loom and stand erect. You don't have to bend over, you don't have to be leaning from the front of the loom, looking into the back, you just get to stand here, do all your work standing perfectly straight, and it's so easy on your body. Okay, we're going to take this rod and we're going to slide it through the end of our cross. Here we have the cross in our warp. And you can see it's a nice figure eight. The rod is going to go through this figure eight and get attached to the apron rod. Before I attach them, I need to attach them with something. So I'm going to use this same twine. This is a highly twisted cotton cord that's very, very strong and durable. It doesn't fray. We need to have two pieces of it that are about 16 inches long. So about like that. I'll cut one. I'll cut the second. They are going to get half hitched to our apron rod right here. I'll half hitch this one first like that. And I'll half hitch to the other side now. These two pieces of string always stay on my loom. They're always there ready to tie our rod on with. Now I take the rod, we go through the cross, and I'm going to attach them. I'm going to tie these two rods together. All right, we are going to take the two strings and lay them on top of the rod. One string comes up on one side, the other string comes up on its side. We then tie it into a bow. There's the first part, and here's our little bows. And we're careful to leave a one inch space between the apron rod and the rod that holds the warp. Now I'll do the same thing on the other side. Leaving the space gives us room to spread this warp out. One comes up one side, one comes up on the other side, and we're going to tie them in a bow just like you tie your shoes, like that. There's the bow, and we have a one inch space left between the apron rod and the rod that holds the warp. So they're parallel to each other. The next thing I need to do is 
to attach the leaf sticks. Insert the leaf sticks into the cross and attach them to the castle. So I'm going to use my same twine again. I'm going to cut two lengths. When cutting the string to attach the leaf sticks to the castle and the back beam, the cord needs to be two yards long. So there's my first one. There's my second. These two lengths. Huh. This kinky string. They get folded in half like so. And they get half hitched around the castle posts. Just like that. And they live here forever. I'll do the other side now. Okay, our leaf sticks are here, ready to go in. There's our first one. There's our second one. And now I'm going to attach them over here. We take one half of our cord. And I don't go right to the end, I sort of fold it back. I'm going to go up through that hole and down so that we can come up through that hole. Then we take our other cord and we go down, pull it all the way through, and then go down through the other hole. What we end up with is this lovely little cross section here. There's a figure eight running through the two leaf sticks and that prevents the leaf sticks from riding on top of each other. I'm going to put one more little twist in it like that and then I'm going to wrap them around the back beam. I'll wrap them several times to get rid of the excess length. I'm going to tie it up nice and snug with a bow. There. Our leaf sticks are perfectly separated. They move up and down on our castle. And now I'm going to go do the other side. I take one half of my string, if I can find it. <laughs> I am going to come up. up. The other half I'm going to go down and down. There we go. Put the little twist in. Tie her up to the other side. This cord was a little shorter. That's about as short as you can get. There you go. These sticks are suspended perfectly between the castle posts and the back beam. We're ready to take the ties out of our warp. I've tied them with bows and I've <laughs> turned it into a knot, so I'm going to carefully snip that. Let's see if I can untie a bow on this side. Alrighty, now our cross is free. So here we go. We're going to use our rattle now to spread this out across the top of the loom. I am going to spread this warp out using my center point, which is marked here on the loom, as my guide. This is a metric rattle. There are five slots in every inch. If we are to take our little measuring tape, put it on here, and count them, there's one, two, three, four, five. Now, if I were to measure that over four inches, 
I'm going to get an extra little slot. So every now and then, every four inches as a matter of fact, I leave an empty hole and that accommodates the fact that it's metric and my brain doesn't always work very well in metric. So I know there's five of these and I have to calculate the number of threads that will go into each one of these individual little slots. This rattle is absolutely brilliant for winding on warps that are fine, smooth yarn. This warp is made out of Euroflax linen. It's a four-ply linen. There are 10 threads in every inch. So if there's 10 threads in every inch, I'm going to break them down into two threads and spread them out in the rattle. I will put two threads in each one of these little slots. I have my center point. The warp is 14 inches wide. So I'm going to go from center over here to seven and know that I'm going to start spreading my warp right there. I'm just going to stick my measuring tape in there to hold the spot. Now, when your warp is sitting like this, sometimes it gets stuck and embedded down in here, and that can be frustrating. So I solve that little problem by putting a piece of paper over the rattle, just like this, which I have right here. And I just slide it down like that. Then the warp threads sit on top and they don't get stuck in anything. I like that. So now it's important to thread from your cross. When you spread your warp, it's really important that you focus in the right area. If I am to look way up here at the threads as they sit on the paper, I can't see anything. If I look here, I don't see much. But if I focus right between the two leaf sticks, I can see the cross as it was as it was created on the warping board or the warping mill, and the threads just pop off. So I'm looking there, I get my first two threads. I grab them and I put them in the first section of the rattle. Here we come with the next set. Pop it in. Both have to go on the same side. When you do this with this rattle, it's wonderful because you get to do the whole thing standing up. So many other rattles are inserted into the beater at the front of the loom and it means that the weaver has to go from the back to the front or bend over like this through the whole thing, breaking your back, trying to see your cross. I love this because I can stand straight. I never have to hurt myself getting my warp spread out and I also get to spread it out perfectly. This rattle allows you to work beautifully with fine threads, with most threads. Sometimes Big fat threads are a problem for it and that's when you might want to choose the other method of warping which is front to back. I generally warp back to front for everything that's smooth and fine like this and reserve that other method of warping front to back for sticky things. Anyway, we can progress through here quite quickly. It's a cinch. I'm going to go on like this until I've got about four inches worth of threads. You can see how quickly it goes. Everything flies off the paper. You can see your cross so easily. When I've got four inches done, I'm going to leave a space to accommodate all that metric stuff. And then carry on again. If you were working 20 ends per inch, you'd put four threads in here. Just do the math and figure it out. One thing I warn against is if you've warped with multiple threads. Supposing you've made a warp and you've got three threads in your hands because you have three cones of, say, white cotton. So that'll make it all go quickly. But then you end up with three threads. It's 20 ends per inch. Hmm, how can I spread that out in here evenly? I would never split a thread group. If you've warped with three threads and you want to put two or four in each one, never take one out of one group and put it into another group. When you've made your warp and those threads are all coming off of their spools together, a slight subtle amount of twist 
has gone into those threads, into that warp, that group of warp threads. That's all sitting on the other side of the loom and eventually it has to pass through the rattle. So if you break them up, one will want to go one way, one has to go around the other way and you end up with snapped threads. So in that case I would put three in one part of the rattle and six in the other part of the rattle at the very end just to accommodate all my threads. Always remember what your rattle's for. Your rattle is just to assist you winding your warp on at the appropriate width. Doesn't matter if it's half an inch too wide or half an inch narrower, it won't make any difference to your weaving. It doesn't create pattern. It just assists you in winding your warp on at the appropriate width. So we're almost at four inches now. Three and a half. I'll put in a couple more. Then I'm gonna leave a space. One more. It's perfect. All right, there's our four inches right there, and you can see that we have sort of our extra slot right here. So we're going to leave it empty, get our next two threads, and there we've bypassed it. And we continue on just like we were before. And now our math will all work out. So, you don't need to watch me do this whole thing. I'll come back in a couple minutes. It'll be all ready. And you'll say, oh my goodness, a shiver fast. We're back and it's almost done. Just a few more to put in. And we're gonna to check to make sure that it's 14 inches wide or close, close counts. There we go. And our measuring tape. Look at that, hecky do, it's 14 right on. So that's good. Now, whoops, I'm not gonna put that there. I'm gonna throw that there. We need to somehow anchor this so that these threads don't go flying out. You know, your cat runs across the room and drags your warp with it and then they're all gone. So we don't want that to happen. My kids have all pulled them out over the years. They'll never do it again. <laughs> all right, this piece of string is just gonna come around here Attach there, we tie it in a nice bow, then our warp threads can't escape. Your cat can charge through the room if it wants to. It won't be able to pull these out. There. So that's hanging there. I'm going to just pop this up here and get it out of the way. Now I'm going to go and get a long piece of cord to lash between the rod that's holding the warp our warp rod and our apron rod. The length of this lashing cord um, depends on how wide your warp is. In this case, I just have to lash from here to here. We're doing this to prevent these rods from bowing. If we don't put any interlacing in between here and we get lots of tension on the warp, then this rod will start to bow and that will change the tension on your warp. We don't want that to happen. So, if I don't get this right the first time, you can always add more. Sometimes I have to add more. You just half hitch another cord on. But I've taken a chunk of yarn, of thread, of same twine to be precise. That's probably uh, three yards long and I fold it in half. I'm going to half hitch this to the apron rod. Voila. Now I'm going to just interlace it about every two inches along here and anchor them. So here goes the first one. I don't count threads or anything, I just eyeball it. There we go. There we go.
This gives lots of good strength back here. So make sure whatever yarn you use or cord you use is a good strong one. Don't use singles homespun or hand spun. Alrighty, our last one. Oh, am I good? Look at that, I cut it just the right length. Now I'm going to just tie it to itself. I'm just tying it to itself. Take out all the slack and one more little half knot there. So we have maintained the one inch space between the two rods throughout the whole thing. You don't want to cinch it up like this. Just maintain that same distance so that these two rods are parallel. Now that that's done, the warp is running from the rattle to the back of the loom in a nice straight line. We're going to pull out all that slack in a minute and we're going to start to beam this baby. Everything's moving beautifully through here, but I have to tighten some things up at the front. So we're going to go to the front of the loom. And this is where our warp chain is lying. If any messiness has occurred while you separated everything and put it into the rattle, this is the time to get rid of it. So you move to a place in the warp where no threads have been disturbed and you give the warp a good tug. It causes the leaf sticks to bow a little bit, but they're just bowing as I pull. And when you release it, everything's fine. It does make everything bow back there, but it's no big deal. Nothing's going to break. You pull out anything that's messy. I have this disgusting technique called licking your fingers and pulling your warp threads down. You don't have to do that. There we go. So this is nice and perfect and straight. And now I'm going to wind it on. I'm going to do it all by myself. I have this trusty roll of paper and we're going to use it between all the layers of the warp. I personally prefer paper to sticks because I find that our warps are long and we run out of sticks and you get lazy with sticks but if you have a good roll of paper and you get it in straight then it just is always there a flatbed between every layer of warp and your warp is wound on well. So let's look at our brake system a little bit. Earlier on, I eased off this nut on the threaded screw here that controls the friction band around the brake. I did that so that we could move this beam back and forth without uh, any problems. What we don't want to have happen is when I start beaming the warp and then put tension on it, I don't want to pull on the warp and have the whole thing come off the beam again. So luckily we have this little toggle here. This little toggle engages a ratchet on the back side of this chunk of wood right here. This little toggle just fits down snugly and locks the system so that the uh, warp can't be pulled off again. I have this toggle on and engaged when I'm warping the loom, but when I go to weave, I want the toggle off. So the only time we want to engage this is when we're warping it and it prevents from the warp from being pulled off while we're winding on and tensioning. It holds the beam so that when I pull on the other side, this can't move. It can go in one direction, but it can't go back. So that's great. I'm ready to beam this warp. I'm going to beam it with paper. At my local post office, I got this lovely piece of paper for $2.95. Isn't it lovely? It has little chickadees on it. You can get it with party hats and other things. But we're using this paper because it's nice and firm and uh, sort of rigid, which is what we want. So I'm going to start winding this on. You could use this little handle here. That's what it was put there for. But I like to just use my hands. I get my first wrap around. And as soon as I am about to come up to my second wrap, I put the paper in. I make sure that the paper goes in nice and straight. 
If you get it in straight, it's easy to keep it straight. If you don't get it in straight, it's hard. Life's bad. So I'm going to line it up with my, with my apron rod. I was very careful to make sure that the apron rod and the, the warp rod were parallel to each other and that they were perfectly straight. So if I line my paper up to that, then we're just hunky-dory. So we're ready. The paper's going in. And I'm going to go to the front of the loom so that I can give it a good pull and tug and straighten out anything and see what's happening up here. When I come here, I pull on that warp, I tug on it. If I have to do anything, it's generally just a little flick, flick, flick. Give it a good tug, lay it down flat, come back here, and wind some more. My paper's going on nice and straight. because I got it in nice and straight. If your paper starts wandering off its track, again, lick your fingers and just hold it. You've got a little friction there and you can push it back on track. There. I'm going to go to the front, give it some more tension. I have one errant little thread here that needs to be pulled down. I watch, I'm looking here. Goes back, spit and pull. Remember, you don't have to do that. By coming to the front of the loom every few turns and pulling on the warp, we're realigning everything. We have an opportunity to look at our rattle and make sure that nothing's binding up on it. I'm pulling very firmly as you can see um, and we want to wind it on nice and tight. All right at the back again. I want this warp on nice and tight and I'm warping all by myself. So one of the ways to make sure that what you've already beamed is really really tight is to take your paper and pull down on it. Oh, there, my little ratchet's in. So when I pull down, it snugs up the paper. You know when you have, when you buy a big roll and you stick your hand in, you can make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller inside. By pulling on the paper at this point, every couple of turns, it pulls any slack that's there. I'm going to get rid of that at the front, like that. Everything's straight again and I'm going to beam some more. So I'll turn it a couple of times, watching my paper, it's nice and straight. I'm going to pull down on my paper, get out any slack, go to the front. Here when I pull it and flick it, everything just pops into alignment. Wind on some more. This is a five yard warp. You can see the tiny little bit of slack that came out. All I do is flick those little crosses out like this. Some people just can't bear to not get out all of your grooming implements and comb your warp and brush it and do all of those things. Sometimes that just makes the matter, the whole, the whole situation worse. So a few flicks, good tension, and everything is right again. If you use wimpy paper when you do this, 
you can't pull on wimpy paper and have it not rip. So it's best to get nice heavy paper. Canada Post must have known I had made my work five yards long. <clears throat> All right, we're done. It is beautiful. We're right up here. That's about as far as you can go. We're gonna take our little cord off that was hiding or holding everything in its place. It's done its job. So we just pop it off like that. Toss it behind you. <laughs> and look at that. Our warp's all there, ready to go. Now, I am going to use the ledge of my little shelf to trim its bangs. Then they're all trimmed to the same length. This is how my mother trimmed my bangs. <laughs> With a ruler. Here we are. We're almost done. Here's our last bundle. Boing! So this is all the loom loss we're going to have on this end. It's not very much. We're ready to take this out of here. I'm going to just pop it out in little chunks like so. Stick my hand in here, grab it, and then just let it drop down like that. Now I'm going to get my next chunk. Run away threads. Wink. The last batch. Wink. The easiest way to thread this loom is to actually sit right inside it. So to achieve that, we have to take the beater off. And the cool thing about this beater is that the entire thing just lifts up and off like this. As easy as pie. The next thing we're going to do is take the breast beam off. Just pops off those little pegs. And then I'm going to get a chair and sit right inside. So when you can sit right inside your loom like this, it's Again, so much easier on your body. One of the reasons, another one of the reasons why I love this loom so much. On the harnesses or the pattern shafts, we have these things called Texolve heddles. All the heddles on Louette looms are made out of Texolve. Texolve is a nylon string manufactured in Sweden. And they make a little heddle and it comes up and it goes in a loop at the top and it comes down and they loop like this. There's a loop at the bottom here, a loop at the top, a loop at the bottom, a loop at the top. And they come like this in packets of 100. The easiest way to make these into individual heddles is to cut them before you put them on the loom. So I always just stick my finger right up there, nice and tight, and I look for all those loops and I just snip through them. If you do this before you put them on the loom, you save yourself a great deal of grief. It's not hard to do the ones that are here, but it's really difficult to cut them down here. So if you cut them all before they go on the loom, then you don't have to worry about it. At the end of the DVD, I'm going to show you some tricks on how to move Texolve heddles easily and efficiently. Um, but I'm going to do that later. Anyway, all the heddles are on this loom. So we're ready to start threading them. I reach in behind there and grab my first batch of threads. This happens to have a blue stripe and a purple stripe, so I'll take both of them, but it doesn't really matter. I straighten them all out. 
kind of put my finger in the cross and make sure they're nice and straight and smooth. Now, one of the really cool things about suspending your leaf sticks the way we did at the back of the loom means that at this point right now, I don't want to have to bend over like this to see my cross to get them threaded in the right direction. I don't want to have to lean back. I want to be able to sit nice and straight, look dead ahead, and see my cross where my eyes don't have to move. So I can push down on this. I can raise it up. I can do whatever I want because it's sliding up and down on that, on this. I'll do the same thing there. And now, because of the little cross between them, I can pull my leaf sticks close to me. And now I can see my cross right there. I don't have to bend over. I don't have to do anything. And that saves a lot of grief for my back. So lots of people thread their heddles with sleigh hooks or threading hooks. I don't use a threading hook. And I've gotten very quick at not using a threading hook. And I'm going to show you how I do it. I'll take a group of heddles and move them into the general vicinity. I don't need all of these heddles. And this warp is only 14 inches wide. So I'm going to get a bunch of these out of the way. I'm just going to put some of them over there. And they just slide along. You push them from the top and the bottom over. When your loom is brand new, sometimes there's a little overlapping on the heddles and they're a tad ornery. But once they um, have been used and separated after a warp or two, they behave themselves like good little heddles. One thing I want to draw your attention to before we thread the loom is this blocking pin. The blocking pin goes through the holes in the Texolve where they're marked with black marker pen right along here. When the pin is in, it holds all of the pattern shafts in neutral position, which means they can't move around when you're threading the loom or when you're tying the loom up underneath. This pin has to be removed for the loom to weave, but when you're not weaving or when you're threading or tying up, it's good to put it in. So this is how we do it. I'll pull the pin out. It's gone. Now these things can move up and down, but I want to lock them. So you just go, there's a hole in the Texolve every centimeter. You pick it up with the pin and everything's blocked. Great for marshmallows in the summer too. All right, to thread this loom, I'm going to transfer this bundle of threads in my hand, in my right hand, to my left hand. And I will hold them under tension in my left hand almost through this whole process. If you can't do this whole thing by holding it all the time, that's okay too. We'll, I'll show you how to adapt the technique. But I come in with my right hand. I grab the first thread coming from my cross by looking at my leaf sticks. My leaf sticks give it to me quite easily. This finger on my left hand comes and grabs my first heddle and it isolates it for me. I hold it tight and pop the thread through like that. So what happens next is my hand comes in, gets the second thread. I pull it out, make my loop. This finger has to access the thread on the second pattern shaft. I don't look in here at all. I access my shafts by looking at the bottom of the pattern shaft, the wood. I found the second one. I pull it out, I hold the head eye open, and push the thread in. Two. Get another thread. Now I'm counting across the bottom. One, two, three. I access my next thread. There you can see some crossed heddles because they're brand new. Just have to pop them out, and eventually they're all individual heddles and they move quite freely. Here's our next one. We're threading this loom one to eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So one, two, three, four. It's so easy when you just look at the bottom of the pattern shaft, you find the heddle right away. There's my next one. 
next thread around six my next thread is on seven my last and the sequence is on eight now there are many different theories on marking heddles so that you can access Texolve heddles easily. Some people like to paint their heddles on different pattern shafts different colors. The problem with doing that is when you move heddles from one shaft to another shaft, then you have all of these different colors on different shafts and it doesn't make sense. So it can become confusing. What I recommend people do before they start marking up their loom is to try threading it this way to keep track of the heddles the same way that I'm doing by looking at the bottom of the pattern shaft first. If you have to do anything, maybe you would like to put a black line on harness on pattern shaft one, three, five, and seven, and leave two, four, six, and eight blank. That's one way of marking your loom up so that it's not so confusing. Helps you find your pattern shaft quicker. Now we start over again. One, another twisted heddle, two, eight, three, and on three. If you are used to using a threading hook, by all means, use one. I have just found that this system works quickly for me. And the thing we have to remember is that everyone has different finger dexterity and, and things work differently for other people. So if you have to put this down to go in here and access your threads and your heddles, go ahead. <laughs> put it down. After you've done a few of your threading patterns, or pattern repeats, it's really important to go back in and check them before you continue on because this is the time to fix it if you need to fix something. So I'm going to quickly go in and just re recheck this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. By fanning them out like this you can really see easily how everything has been threaded. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I know that these two bouts of warp threads have no errors in them. They're threaded correctly and so nothing moves. I'm going to tie a little thingy. And in the blink of an eye your loom is threaded. I'm going to go and get the beater and put it back in and the breast beam and install that and then we're going to slay the loom. To put the beater in, you need to put it in on an angle, break side first. So it goes like that, and this side goes in, straightens out, and at the very bottom, it just fits into these little cup hooks there. <laughs> so the beater's back on. Now I'll get the breast beam. The breast beam has two holes on the bottom, and they fit onto these little pegs here, like that. And like that. So we're ready to slay the loom. I'm going to get a bench. I'll be right here in two shakes of a lamb's tail. Like that. And now I'm sitting here. So when I slay my reed, I like to be up, sitting at the loom. I have my little reed hook here. Me, me, me. Now, there are lots of people who like to block their beater from moving, but I find that hard again on my back because if my beater is blocked and locked into one position, to see my threads and to see this, I have to move around a lot. So I don't do that. I want my body to remain upright and straight. So I let the beater do the moving and my eye gets to stay and focus in the same place all the time. And I find that easier on my back. 
I'm going to mark or find the place where I need to start slaying from. I've pre-marked on this beater uh, center point and this warp is 14 inches wide so I'm going to start slaying here. All of the Louette looms come with tendent reeds. So this is a tendent reed and that just happens to be perfect because my warp has 10 ends per inch. So all I have to do is put one end in every dent. So I'm going to go in here and get my first bunch of warp threads. I grab the bundle quite close up to the heddles so that this finger is able to pop them off. Then because my beater can move, I go up and I grab it and I pull it through. Before I do anything else, I put my slaying hook into the reed in the next slot. I pull this back so I can see in here, I get the next heddle, my beater goes up and we grab it together. I put my slot, my reed in the neck, my slaying hook in the next slot, go up and get it, pull it through. This way I don't have to move very much. My head stays pretty much in the same position. This hand moves a bit. Grab the thread, pull it back. Goes in, up, pull it back. It's very, very quick. Occasionally I need to assist myself getting back in here, especially when the when you're working with a greater number of pattern shafts and there's greater depth between shaft 1 and shaft say 32 in which case my arm comes in and my reed hook assists me in finding the individual thread and often not everything's as easy as one in every dent anyway I've got that first batch all done I'm going to move to the front again and put a slip knot in. A thing me. <laughs> so I go in, get my next batch, keeping my finger in nice and close to the heddles, and I'm ready to continue on. At this point, right now, I'm having to sort of look between the handle down. All of um, the larger Louette looms, the Spring, the Delta, the Octodo, and the Magado, all have got handles on the beaters. And they're wonderful because they allow you to always grab your beater from center point. It also brings the beater a little closer to you so you can sit further back. But at this point in the slaying game, I do have to look down through here to see where my reed hook goes. But as you can see, I still don't have to move much. Alrighty, I'm going to continue this and I'll have it slayed in the wink of an eye. You won't even have time to go get a cup of tea. Be right back. What we have to do is release our front apron, bring it forward like this, and we're going to attach our warp to that front apron. Now we could open 10 different books and you could find 10 different ways to tie a warp onto an apron. What I think you need to do is find the way that works best for you. All right, I'm going to work with four threads at a time in two bundles. So I've got one in a dent. I want four dents worth of threads. In this case, it's four threads, four and four. I want them to come down straight to the apron rod. They go over top of the apron rod, come up on either side. I go through the loop here once, and I go through the loop a second time. This isn't my final tension, but it's how I initially attach the warp to the apron rod. Right now I'm going to quickly just move over to this side of the apron and do the same thing. I'm going to get four threads, smooth them down, lay them on top, bring this up here, 
bring this up there and tie her on through the loop once, through the loop a second time, and cinch it up. Now that the rod is up, I can work from the right to the left and I don't have to stop. four and four. They come down nice and smooth. Go through the loop once, a second time, cinch. Next bundle. All of these things may be a little different, but once you do them a few times, they get easier and easier. And this method of tying on has a little bonus at the end, which you will see once I get them all on. Okay. Our warp is now attached to the apron rod, but this isn't our final tension. If we want to have perfect tension on this warp, we have to adjust it, and this is the simplest way I've found to adjust a warp. Over here on the right-hand side where we first started, it's kind of soggy. It's tighter on the left-hand side, so we have to fix that. But that knot that we used where you went through the loop once and then through the loop the second time is an adjustable knot. It's very easy to move that knot. I'm going to use the one thing on a loom that moves every knot with the same amount of tension, and that is the cloth beam. So I'm going to tension, put tension on my cloth beam, bring this forward, and then I'm going to move along the warp, and I'm going to press on all of these ever so slightly, again and again, because this was the tighter side, and I want to make it the same tension as the looser side. Anyway, it's pretty good. I'm going to tighten it up a little bit more. And now, to make sure everything's perfect, I'm going to move from one side of the loom to the other side of the loom, cinching up, putting in a final holding knot, and then we're done. But this won't move much, having done, having moved this beam. So, cinch as tight as I can. It moved just a tiny little bit. I'm going to move from the right-hand side of the loom consistently to the left-hand side of the loom. I'm not going to stop to answer the phone or talk to anybody because I want this tension to be right. So if you move quickly from one side to the other, you end up with everything the same. I'm not comparing one against another. I'm just cinching them all up as tightly as I can. They're barely moving. That pressing that we did a moment ago really equalizes everything across the warp. I find this very handy. There we go. So, everything is perfectly tensioned. If this side is a smidgen looser, I'm going to leave it because this side was done about a minute ago. When this side has had a minute to rest and relax, it'll probably feel exactly the same as this side. So, I'm going to walk away and leave it. Come back in 20 minutes and it'll be perfect, ready to weave. Everything will feel the same. What we're going to do next is go underneath the loom, tie it up. We're going to tension 
the floating breast beam and I'm going to explain to you how the parallel countermarsh works and then we'll be ready to weave. Well, here we are underneath the loom getting ready to tie up the parallel countermarsh system to the treadles. A countermarsh loom is a loom that is really a jack loom and a counterbalance loom all rolled into one. And they're great when you have multiple shaft looms because you get this nice, great, big, huge shed, no matter how many pattern shafts you've got. So that's a wonderful thing. From this vantage point, we can have a better look at how the parallel countermarsh system works. We have our two sets of lambs, our upper and our lower. If I put a tie-up cord on the upper lamb and pull down on it, it will make the pattern shaft sink, like this. It's coming down. Now, if I put a tie-up cord on the lower lamb and pull down on it, it makes the pattern shaft rise, like it's doing. In either case, what's happening is that both the upper and the lower lamb are moving in a parallel position to each other. I pull down, they come together. I pull down, they move apart. But they're always traveling a parallel path no matter which I do. Your upper lambs are your sinking lambs and your lower lambs are your rising lambs and so you have two kinds of cords that, that go with each one. Your short cords are for your rising ones, so they're your bottoms. Short cords are for bottoms. Long cords are for upper lambs. They're your sinkers. Um, this little warp that we put on the loom is just a straight draw, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we're going to tie it up so that we can weave tabby or plain weave on it. So let's think about being a little jack loom first because they're, they're probably the looms that most people have if you don't have a counter marsh loom. If you were going to tie up tabby on eight shafts for a jack loom, you would tie up one, three, five, and seven on one treadle and then you'd tie up two, four, six, and eight on another treadle. So what I like to do is just think that my lower lambs are my jack lambs. And I'm going to tie up one, three, five, and seven on my lower lamb. And then for the same treadle, because on a, counter on a counter marsh loom you have to tie up both lambs, what rises and what falls, um, then I'm going to tie up two, four, six, and eight on the upper lamb above the same treadle, and we're going to link them all to, one, to that treadle. This is an eight shaft loom. It has 10 treadles on it. These are your lower lambs and these are your upper lambs. Every single treadle under here has got a, la has got a set of grooves directly above it and then there's a corresponding set of grooves directly above that on your upper lambs. Here are the corresponding grooves on the lower lambs directly above the treadles all the way along. You might even notice that there's two corresponding grooves here but no treadles. That's because this loom could eventually become a 12 shaft loom. The grooves are already here. When you get your extra four pattern shafts the treadles come in the extension kits. They plunk in right here and there's your grooves. Two on this side and two on the other side. So eventually this loom could have 12 pattern shafts and 14 treadles. Lots of possibilities with that. When you want to take the cords off the treadles, you need to lift up on the treadle like this, which puts a little loop here. You grab the bottom of the Texolve and just pop it off the screw by pushing up. It goes very quickly. Lift up on the treadle to take the slack off the cord, or to give slack on the cord, I guess, and then pop that off the screw. So. It's quite a simple system, simple and elegant. I'm going to take them all down and then I'm going to tie them all up in just a second. I'm going to use these two treadles. Um, here's my corresponding grooves above this treadle. So let's work on that one first. I'm going to take everything off and then I'll show you very, very carefully how to put them on. 
here we have a piece of Texolf cord. Texolf comes in a long coil and you can cut the cord to any length that you want. But the thing to note is that every centimeter there's a hole. When you cut them, there's no strength at all in, in where you have cut them. So here it's opened up into this little tail and here it's still joined together but there's no strength there whatsoever. So when we use a hole, we're going to use a hole away from this one. Here we go. We're going to put it around the lamb. When, you're, when your cords get, uh, have been used a few times, it's really easy to pop everything through here because the holes sort of stay open. When they're brand new, they're a little tough, but once you've used them a bit, they work nicely. So there you go. Nice and snug around the lower lamb we have a tie-up cord on one. Now I'm going to put one on three. So I just count them across. One, two, three. And through the hole. There's one, three. Two, three, four, five. Okay, one, three, five, and one on seven. One, three, five, and seven. Ta da! So now we have to put them on the upper lamps. So we're going to look for the grooves that are corresponding directly above. We did one, three, five, and seven on the bottom. And now with my nicely pre-cut cord, the great thing is that all of these cords come pre-cut. I'm going to attach this to the second up here. So we did one, three, five, seven down there. We're going to do two, four, six, eight up here, the exact opposite. goes through the hole, it cinches up, and here's the important point. If we have a, a cord on our upper lamb number two, it must come in front of the lower lamb number two, in front. Boing, there it is. Now I'm going to put one on four. One, two, three, four. Find your groove, pop it through the hole, cinch it up, and now I'm going to look for lower lamb number four. Two, three, four. There it goes in front. Looking for six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Find your groove. Find your groove, baby. Cinch it up. And there's in front of number six. Once you've done this a few times, it goes faster and faster. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you find your groove. Pop it in. And there's our eighth back there slide it down. Now we've got everything tied up to make that shed. Tying on to the treadle is quite a simple little feat. Uh, I'm just going to draw your attention to these four holes here. Those four holes with no screws in it at this moment are they're there uh, to accommodate the extra four shaft extension kit so that when you do go to more treadles or and more pattern shafts, you have to be able to tie those extra four pattern shafts up. So in the extension kit, you get four extra screws and you just pop them in there. And then you've got a place to tie up 12 treadles, 12 pattern shafts. Okie dokie. I'm going to take, I'm going to lift up on the treadle. It's important that you lift up the treadle. Then you move to the end of your very first cord. Here's our first cord. I just push it on like like that 
and then push it on with my thumb. So it's just this simple little flick of your thumb. Then I go get my next one. There's my second one. I lift up on the treadle a little bit, push it on the side, and pop it on with my thumb. It's very easy. Close like that, and push it with your thumb. It's that action, this little action. Get your next chord, did that one. It is important that you take these in the right sequence. Very important, but if you've been careful, bringing them down and they're all nice and straight. It is not a difficult thing at all. On. There, we're all on. Again, remember, I didn't use the very, very end hole to attach it because there's no strength in that in this hole. There's a, just a tiny bit of a join at the end here. So it's the hole up. But when you get them all up, sometimes you have this little bit of slack in the cord. That doesn't make any difference. As long as when you push on the whole treadle like that, everything's nice and straight. So there, our first treadle's all tied up. All right, let's do the second treadle. We did on our lower lambs, one, three, five, and seven on the first treadle. So our lower lambs now are going to have two, four, six, and eight on them. So here's two, four, six. Oh, I've got one on seven, so we'll pop that off and use it on six. Now, if you were tying up all these treadles, all ten treadles, after a while, you might be a tad uncomfortable. So, I was talking to a friend of mine who has this loom, and she said to me, Oh, heck, we don't get under there anymore. Al and I just pop that loom onto two milk crates. So what they do is, to avoid being stuck on the floor in this rather uncomfortable position, they have two milk crates in their studio, and uh, they just lift it up. It takes about four seconds to pop it up onto two milk crates, and she sits on a chair in the front of the loom and does all of this, which sounds pretty good to me at this point. All right, we did our lowers. Now we're going to do our uppers. So we did two, four, six, and eight on the lowers. We're going to do one, three, five, and seven on our uppers. One. It goes in front of lower lamb number one. Three goes in front of lower lamb number three. One, two, three, four, five. Goes in front of lower lamb number five. And seven. goes in front of, get in there, lower line number seven. There. And now I'm going to attach them all to the treadle again. So here's our first one. Pop it on with your thumb. Pop. Pop on. There. Voila. It is done. All tied up. So now we can stand up and get ready to weave. I'm going to take my leaf sticks out. We don't need them anymore. If you leave your leaf sticks in this position, you're impeding your shed from opening. It will only be able to open as far as your leaf stick, and we want it to be able to move from the back pattern shaft right to the back beam. So we'll remove them.
I leave these cords attached to my loom. They're great things for cats to play with. You have great fun when they suck up your vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Happens all the time. <clears throat> all right. The next thing I'm going to do is address our brake system because we took it off before. All right. At the very beginning of the DVD, when we dem started demonstrating the spring, I took the tension off of this nut, off this threaded, threaded shaft of this screw. And that took all the tension off the tension brake. And I also engaged this little toggle into the ratchet system on this side. Well, the first thing I want to do to put all that back the way it was is get rid of the toggle. I want my warp to be able to go forward now. And it won't ever be able to go forward if the toggle's engaged. So toggle now is off. Now we need to get our friction back on our brake. So earlier on, I, re I took this nut and moved it all the way off so that this thing was nice and loose and moved. If this should happen, if this should come off, it just hooks back on here. It's because we have no uh, resistance on it. So the brake should be horizontal to the floor. I am going to tighten up this nut until we've gotten that in place. Tighten, tighten, tighten. A bit more. There. Looks pretty good. If you want to do a little bit more. There. We can adjust this perfectly later on as soon as we start weaving. If we have too much friction on, when we release the tension and it goes boing, then we're gonna put we're gonna slack this off a bit. The next thing we need to do is pull the blocking pin. Just pull it out and everything just goes to neutral position. The exciting moment is here. I have to get just right. All right, here's our first treadle action. I'm going to step on either of these two treadles. It's just plain weave. Every single shed on this loom is the same. If you were working with 12 pattern shafts and 14 treadles, every shed would be the same. It's the brilliance in the engineering of this loom. Uh, Jan Louette's a great engineer. Here's the next one. Look at that. And it's so easy to treadle. It takes no effort at all. Big, beautiful sheds. If you were weaving and you stepped on your treadle, opened your shed the whole width, and you found that your lower, um, your lower warp thread was sitting up here like this, wasn't right down against the shuttle race, there's this great way that we can adjust the height of the entire beater by moving down to the bottom of the loom here. If you notice, there's a little foot that comes out of the base of the beater. It's a threaded shaft screw that goes right up into here. I think probably about four or five inches. Anyway, you can raise and lower the beater by screwing it in or screwing it out. So I'm screwing it all the way in. You can see that you could really raise this a lot if you wanted to. Whatever you do on this side of the loom, you have to do on that side of the loom. But it allows you to get this perfect adjustment and I think we were about there. Let's see when I step on that treadle. Oh, a little high. We're not right on top. So I'm going to lower it. Am I going the right way? There we go. Here we go. I'm just going to use this linen as my header. Doesn't really matter brings it all into alignment. When you tie a nice small bouts like we did, everything comes into alignment very quickly. Now, here's another brilliant point about these looms. This handle. This handle is so wonderful. You grab from center all the time. You're never 
grabbing from the sides so your beater always comes down and hits the fell of your cloth bang on. So I'm going to weave for a second and then we're going to have to advance our breast beam or advance our warp. So that gives us the chance to look at our floating breast beam. All right, if I were to advance now, I'd lean over here and I'm going to lift up on the brake, ratchet it forward, and you'll see that this whole thing is moving. I'll do it again so that you can see more. You lift up on the brake, the breast beam tilts in, I ratchet it forward and the breast beam moves to this position, this upright position. Now, if I test that tension right now, it's not tight enough. So I'm going to keep cranking until I get the tension just the way I want it. Actually, I'm going to have the treadles in neutral and test the whole warp. That's good. Right there. But now my whole breast beam's wonking way out here. We don't want that to happen. So I'll teach you about how this works. There is a Texolve cord that is attached to a spring at the back of the loom that's tucked in right here. And this spring, which goes boing, 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 it hides behind your castle upright. That's where it lives. It travels down to the bottom of the loom, goes over this little wheel, this wheelie deely thing, comes through here and attaches to the front of the beam. It is attached just to a little screw, just like all the treadles are attached. So if we pull on the spring, then we can take it off. There's a cord like this on the other side of the loom, exactly the same. What I'm going to do is I'm going to count the number of holes in the Texolve, and I'm going to reattach it to the screw so that this is brought into this position. I can push it to that position, but I want it to be held by the Texolve in the spring. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm going to start with eight. I'll start with nine and just see what happens. I'll move it to nine on this side. And it's come in a lot. I think I'll put a bit more tension on it so it's perfectly straight. So that was nine, 10, 11. Let's try 12. come in a lot. I'm going to do it on the other side. I'll be back in one second. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side because that may be one reason why it's still out here a little bit. So I'll be right back. And there. Much better. Much, much better. Let me check that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I've got it on 13 there, so I'm going to put it on 13 here and we're perfect. Now this is a lot of tension because I'm weaving a linen warp. You may not want that much tension and that's fine. This innovative system isn't found on any other loom. What actually happens when you step on a treadle is this. Imagine that my body is the loom, the frame of the loom, and that my arms are the warp threads. When you step on a treadle, the shed opens. Usually on a loom, that means that the warp threads get tighter. In this case, at the same time that the shed opens, the front breast beam actually rocks forward just a tiny little bit. That means that the tension is exactly the same when you open your shed as it is when it's closed because then the breast beam goes straight again. So there's this little rocking action on that floating breast beam, that's why it's floating, that makes your tension exactly the same when it's open or closed. It's brilliant and if you're working with highly tensioned warps, you never have to worry about breakage. There's much less wear and tear on your warp because of this system. So we have that and we have the fact that every time we advance that warp, if we make sure that our breast beam is perpendicular to the floor, the tension's exactly the same as it was before we let it off. It's perfect. The other wonderful thing is the weaving depth. You have this 
great shed that never diminishes. Always the same. And you have a very good weaving distance in the front. Which means you don't have to advance your warp so frequently. So this is a very small loom. A small loom that has a huge shed, a huge number of pattern shafts, doesn't take up a great deal of real estate in your house, and weaves beautifully. Every now and then, you have to move your heddles. I'm going to show you the easiest way to move Texolf heddles. You need twist ties, and you wrap them around like that. You need four twist ties for every batch of heddles you move. This keeps them from all falling apart because if you take them off without maintaining their cross, it's a real pain in the neck getting them back on. So top and bottom, front and back, four places. I put my little twist ties. I'm almost done. Voila. All right, now I've got to take them off the pattern shaft. So remember this is a Texolv cord right here, and this little dimple fits inside. Now, if you've got good eyes and you don't take your eye off that hole, you'll always get it back in the same place. But sometimes I just like to be sure, so I put a little wee tiny black dot there so I don't screw up. So I'm going to pop that off like that, and you take your heddles off, then you would pop this right back in to that hole that you marked. So I'm going to put these back on because they belong here. Pop that off. Put your heddles on because you've got your cross marked. And then bring this up here. And pop her on. Pop. Now I can take my twist ties off. And we're back to normal. <laughs>